And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them, the proceeds, to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So you see our um, Essential Elements series. We looked at the Word of God, the Apostles' teaching last Sunday. Today is going to be fellowship. Then we have hospitality, prayer, generosity, and evangelism. We think that these are essential ingredients to Uh, any church, the local church that you're sitting at and being part of right now, hopefully we have these things. And so we've been using this sermon series to also evaluate where we are uh, because we live in a day and age where preferences are the name of the game. When when anybody has a preference, that becomes the most important thing. Now, it's not bad to have a preference. You all have preferences. I have certain preferences. The problem is when the preference becomes a priority, we begin to get into trouble. And many churches and many people who are seeking churches, if they think that their preferences are primary, then it's probably a problem. I I, I didn't say that the first service. They're just there. All those peas are in my head. Um, So for example, okay, you came to church today, you pulled into the parking lot and uh, you looked around. Is there parking? space. Man, I can't even find a place to park, and uh, i got to walk this far. They better do something about this. There's a long distance to walk, and uh, got to the front door, and somebody welcoming me. Are they smiling? Oh, I didn't want somebody to welcome me. I'm an introvert. I don't want anybody to talk to me. Just leave me alone. Or, you know, they should have really engaged me. They should have really asked me who I am. And uh, then I walked in there, and and, uh, do they have donuts? They do have donuts. And wait a second, is my notes right? That's an essential thing, I think. Donuts are essential. Um, but did they have donuts? Did they have hot coffee? Did they have uh, orange juice? Did we get inside the sanctuary and was it bright enough? Was it light enough? Or was it too dark? Or was it too loud? Or was it too soft? Or did they sing the kind of music that I like? Or, or did they sing the kind of music that my parents liked? And, and we all have preferences. As a matter of fact, can I just tell you, I have preferences too. And uh, I don't like every single thing that we do as a church. Um, but here's the news flash. Um, it's not my church, and it's not your church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ's church. He says, I will build my church. And so the challenge for us in this series is not to let our preferences become our priorities to be primary in our church, because it really, at the end of the day, doesn't matter what our preferences are. Our church must be about the Lord Jesus Christ, about His supremacy above all things, the worship of His name, the glory that's due to God Almighty. And whatever our preference is, whether we eat in a nice building like this or a tent or in the open air, it doesn't matter. The the most important thing is that the name of Jesus Christ be praised. Today we're going to look at a word called fellowship, a word that I think is essential uh, to our church. You see that there in Acts chapter 2, the disciples and the apostles were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. The fellowship. First question I have for you, you see in your notes, what is fellowship? What is fellowship? Well, fellowship is uh, in the Koine Greek. Remember last week we talked about the the language of the New Testament? It was uh, Koine Greek, which was the the everyday street language of the Western world. And, and so this Koine Greek word is, maybe you've heard of it, koinonia. Koinonia. Koinonia means um, community. It means to have something in common or a partnership. Uh, it's sharing in something. It's communion. Um, it can be a verb. Okay, so like, what, what were you all doing? Well, we were fellowshipping. We were fellowshipping. You can, it can be a verb, but... It, but really, we see it, it's a noun. It's the, the disciples had devoted themselves to the fellowship, the fellowship, the community, the group. And to look at this a little closer, we're going to go to 1 John chapter 1. And so you can leave Acts and go to 1 John 
chapter 1. That's going to be our spiritual food for the day today. First John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life with, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So what John is recording for us and what the Holy Spirit is teaching us today is what to similarly he reported in John chapter 1, verse 1, that the Word became flesh and made manifest and dwelt among us, the Lord Jesus Christ. That the fellowship that we have is in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that man is sinful, that the God created all there is and it, it, is, it was good, and then man sinned and sin came into the world and forever changed the dynamic between uh, man and God. But God didn't leave us in our sin. God didn't, as the deists believe, pull back and just leave the earth to go rotten. He stepped into the world himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word, put on flesh, and he dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He became one of us, ultimately, to go to the cross and to die for your sin and my sin, and then rise again from the dead so that if anyone would come to him by faith, they could be saved from their sin and could have a right relationship with God Almighty. It's an amazing thing. It's the good news of the gospel. It's the reason why our fellowship exists. The Word made manifest among us. And it's a real thing here. You see in the text too, he, he goes on to even describe it as that. We've looked upon and we have touched with our own hands concerning the Word of life. Remember, Thomas touched Jesus and his scars. Well, we don't know actually if he touched him or not. He was invited to. And Jesus was real. This is not a figment of our imagination. This isn't a hoax brought up by first century fishermen who wanted to die for a hoax. This is the real uh, deal, historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth, who is Jesus Christ, now the Lord, who is coming again to judge the living and dead one day. And uh, this is the real deal, and this is what the fellowship is. This is our fellowship. So we have a community of believers we're together, and um, that's what it is. But who are we to have fellowship with? Look at verse 3, 1 John chapter 1. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Here we see we have fellowship with two different persons. The first one we're going to start with is our fellowship with God, with the Father, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We have a relationship with God, and then because of that, we might have a relationship, here John writes, with us. That's with other believers, with other Christians. Now to me, it kind of harkens back to a question that Jesus was answered, or asked, Jesus was asked, um, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus. And Jesus gave the answer, and he gave a two-part answer. This is, see, this is checking on your Sunday school experience, okay? Jesus was asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And then there's a second one, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. Everything the law and the prophets, the word hinges on those two commandments. And um, strangely, or not so strangely, we see that fellowship is built on those two uh, principles, that we are to have a relationship with God, fellowship with God, and we're, had, we're to have fellowship with other believers, with other Christians, have a relationship with them. Flip over to Ephesians. Keep a finger in 1 John 1 and go to Ephesians chapter 2. I just love this word picture. Here Paul is comparing this fellowship we have with God and with others to a building. Now I like our building. I, I'm so thankful that God has given us this building. I like the, the paint job on the building. I like the new roof on the building. How many people like the new building, the outside? Even if you don't, raise your hand. Go ahead. Yes. And, uh, and you love the colors and everything's great. I know. It's just worked out wonderfully. But they, um, it's great to have a building. Uh, to use. And hopefully we use this building all the time as we can. I mean, let's use it for God's glory all the time. We have called to care that's over 
uh, downstairs in the area that we weren't using. Now they're using it to help uh, unwed mothers and foster families to provide for them. Just a great thing. Let's use this building up uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And for his kingdom work. And so it's so great to have that. But we find in Ephesians chapter 2 that uh, the building that actually God is building is not made of concrete and wood. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. How amazing is that? The fellowship that we have with God and with each other, we see is part and parcel of a building for God to inhabit. God doesn't inhabit this building, although I pray that he's here. God inhabits his people. And when we gather together, when we study God's word together as the foundation, it's the foundational level of God's word, the law, the prophets, the apostles' teaching, what's the cornerstone? Jesus, he's the cornerstone. Now we're being built. Each one of us is a brick. You're a brick. You're a brick. I'm a brick. And we're being built together to be a place for God to dwell, to inhabit, so that when we go out into the world, we're God's hands and feet and feet now. We're his hands and feet. And we're doing the work of God as his people, as his building, no matter where we're at. Beautiful picture. So we're to have fellowship with God and with each other, Christian. Now, just as a side note, who are we not to have fellowship with? Um, back to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, he's going to go on and say this, If we say we have fellowship with him, God, while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So we're not to have fellowship with darkness. With darkness. What's darkness? John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, look at that. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So don't have a partnership with the world, with darkness. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. It's a place where he's talking about being unequally yoked with an unbeliever with a believer and how that is not to be the case. He explains it in a way that's applicable to what we're talking about right now. He says, For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship, there's the word, fellowship has light with darkness? You are not to have fellowship with darkness, with the world, with the, the lust and the sin of the world. Be separate from it. And this comes to our second question, third question. Third question, what hinders our fellowship? What hinders our fellowship is sin. What hinders our fellowship is when we become uh, partakers of, we, we become partners with sin. Look what he says in 1 John 1, now verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what hinders our fellowship is sin. What do we do with sin? when we experience sin? How do we think about sin in our life? Do we say, ah, it's not a big deal. It's just a common struggle that we all face. Don't lose any sleep over it. What do we think? What do you think about your sin? How should we treat it? Well, if you're like me, the temptation is to hide it. To hide our sin. Because who wants to admit their sin? Nobody. Sin is shameful. If I grab a microphone from the sound guys and say, we're going to go through the aisles now, we want you to just kind of share your sin with everybody. Um, you might do it, but you might do sin like, you know, I just really feel bad because I'm the most humble person I know. You know, I just re really feel bad about that. And uh, yeah, you know, if there's one sin I have, it's just I work too hard. You know, I just, I just work too hard. And I, nobody's going to say, um, 
that I struggle with pornography. Nobody's going to say that I lie all the time. Nobody's going to say that I steal from my employer. Why? Because we sin. We all do. And the promise from the darkness is that if we stay in the darkness, it won't catch up with us. That's the promise. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. Here in our text, John tells us that we are to walk in the light. Get into the light. He says there, look at verse 7. If we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us then from the thing that we're keeping in the darkness. I love that. So you want to know, brother and sister, how to experience victory in your life over the sin that so easily entangles you? I don't know what it is, but you're struggling with some sin. How can you have victory over that? It's to get into the light. Expose it. Because when you expose it, then you have fellowship with those people who are around you, who want to help you, and they will help you. And the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse you. The power of the devil is always in the darkness. When, he, when you get in the light, the devil has no power. In one of our first places that we lived, um, Steph and I, we, we had a dog. We loved our dog. And uh, he just went to heaven a little while ago. And uh, if there is a heaven for dogs, um, that's a rabbit trail. I didn't know we were going to go down. Sorry. There is a heaven for dogs. Cats, I don't know as much. But anyway, um, so the... <laughs> We had a little cat, too. It was such a great little cat. He wound, wandered up to the house, and, and it was just a great cat. And, and so we'd be all over the house with the cat. The cat would follow you around. And uh, my uh, oldest son was a little toddler at the time. He named this female cat Roger. So Roger would follow us around. And, and we'd go downstairs, turn all the lights on, and be downstairs. The cat would be down there having a great time. And then we'd come upstairs and, like, turn the lights off. And this cat would just turn into the Terminator cat and just run upstairs and try to break through the door to get out. What's going on? Somebody would come over. We'd try to throw the cat downstairs into the dark basement. Well, we come to, to find out um, that when we would go down there with the lights on, we couldn't notice it. But when we turned the lights off, you could notice it because they came out of everything, the woodwork, the carpet, the everything. It was packed with fleas, fleas, flea biting fleas. And uh, the cat would just be down there, and the lights would go off, and those fleas would just bombard that poor cat. And, uh, and so, but when we turned on the lights, the fleas fleed. Here's the point. Get into the light. Expose the sin. It, it, it has the weight of shame on the front end, but on the other end, there's the freedom that only Christ can give through the blood of His Son, Jesus, forgiveness, and through the fellowship that comes with other people who are with you. Sin will hinder our relationship, our fellowship with one another. Okay, last question. What are the benefits of fellowship? What are the benefits of fellowship? Pastor Steve, I'm telling you, I'm not that into church. I haven't had good experiences with church and church people. I get, I get that we're supposed to, but can you show me any benefits of it? Well, verse 4, we skipped over it pretty quickly. But John says this, we are writing these things to you so that our joy may com be complete. Now, look at your Bibles. You might see a little note on the word are. If you look down, you see some manuscripts say your. So there's an issue. We have equally numerous manuscripts that have uh, the word are here as, as other ones who say your. Could I suggest to you, and I haven't run this past any biblical scholars, and I don't know if this is correct or not, but I think both of those words are there because both of those things are true. I think this is for John's joy, absolutely. It's for the apostles' joy, the leaders of the church. It's for their joy, that, that the people would come in fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, that they would have relationships with one another, that they would walk in the light. That brings joy to John and the disciples and the apostles, brings joy to church leaders. They see people pursuing Christ. But it also is for your own joy, our own joy, when we are fellowshipping with God and with each other, when we are complete, 
sense of um, joy and an experience of the pleasures of God to be found in the fellowship. In Psalm chapter 16, we started the service in it uh, this morning. David says, Therefore my heart is glad, my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Reference to the Messiah, to Jesus, but also a truth for David. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is a benefit in the experience of fellowship with God that brings about immense pleasure does. Now, I, I grew up in circles of uh, conservative Christianity. You know, this is like the, you got to be very careful that nobody gets too charismatic, okay? And, and uh, most people in my church I grew up in, they look like they hadn't smiled in 20 years, okay? And, uh, and you, you know, don't show too much joy. Be careful. You don't go too crazy. And, um, but I wonder if uh, sometimes we err too much on the side of being cautious, because we should be cautious, right? There's crazy people out there, right? And there's crazy Christians out there too. And so we want to be careful about that. And somebody says, well, I've experienced this from God, and I've experienced this from God. And, and I remember one uh, service I went to with my wife, and the lady came up, she said she had a specific word for my wife and I, and she, will, will we receive it? I said, well, we'll hear it. doesn't mean we'll receive it. And she went on and went off on some tangent. I don't even remember what she said. And uh, and it was crazy, okay? It was crazy. Now, here's the thing. We have the Word of God um, as our foundation. Remember last week, the apostles' teaching? We have the Word of God to help us with the subjective experience of the presence of God, but it doesn't mean that the presence of God does not exist. It does. And when we sing God's praise and we sing a thousand hallelujahs, I pray that the Holy Spirit would fill you and move in you to do something in you that you know that the presence of God is here right now in this place. He's not in this building. He's in his people. That's the building. And I want you to experience it. And sometimes you would be driven to tears. And sometimes you would be overwhelmed with emotion. And that's okay. That's good. To experience the pleasures of God Almighty. He, he's more uh, wonderful to experience than any LSD trip or any drug-induced estate to know God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the one who made you. When you get to experience his presence, it'll change your life forever. This is a pleasure, pleasurable benefit of knowing God and having fellowship with Him. Earlier on in this Psalm 16, David says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. So not only does God give us an experience of His presence, which we love, he experience, we experience Him and He gives us guidance. He gives us direction. And um, it's one of those things where I think that sometimes people's um, pursuit of God is just for some experience that they can feel rather than the experience of His presence that makes a changing impact on the way they follow God. And God wants to change us and use us uh, as His body yeah, here, as His building here on earth. And the Holy Spirit does that. Let me give you a couple of different things here just to take a minute because I want to help you. Because maybe you say, I've never experienced that presence of God in my life. And I want to experience the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. I want to have His counsel in my life. I want to be in fellowship with Him that makes a difference. And so let me give you a few things this morning to help, help you, hopefully. Because some people, they wait till the foxhole experience of their life to turn to God in that way. They wait until the cancer diagnosis, stage four, here it is. They wait till they are at wit's end. They're at the bottom of the bottom, the low of the low, and then they turn to God. You can turn to God right now and experience His presence afresh today. In the New Testament, we see a couple of different ways that the Holy Spirit fills His people. When a person is saved, you are saved by God, by His grace, through faith. And when you are saved, you're forgiven for all of your sins, past, present, and future, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in your life. Now, um, 
Some people would say uh, you get more of the Holy Spirit later on in your life or through different experiences, but we believe that the New Testament teaching is pretty clear. Is when you are saved, you receive all of the Spirit of God. He saves you, you receive the Holy Spirit. But the question is uh, not how much of the Holy Spirit you receive, you receive all of Him, uh, but how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? And that's a question that can change. So in order to experience Him uh, in, in a greater way today, let me give you a uh, couple of different scenarios. The first one is, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit, He fills people, we see in different cases, for specific occasions, for special tasks. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, we see the disciples are waiting, and the Holy Spirit comes, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterances. The Holy Spirit descends upon them, fills them, and they speak the gospel in languages that they don't know. Miraculous thing happens. In Acts chapter 4, verse 8, Peter gets up and he begins to preach the truth of Jesus. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, and he goes on and delivers his message. He's given this filling of the Holy Spirit for a special task that he's charged to to take on. Then later in, in the Acts chapter 4, verse 31, they're together again. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, as Stephen is being killed, the first martyr of the church says that, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. There are occasions where the Holy Spirit of God fills a person for a special task or a special occasion, something special going on. So you have all the Holy Spirit when you become a Christian. But how many people would agree there's some times in your life where you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And and there's a task at hand. There's something to be done. And the Holy Spirit fills a person. But then there's also in the New Testament... Growth that a person experiences as they mature in their faith in God. And this growth then produces what uh, we read in the book of Acts is a person who is full of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 6, we see that the widows of the church, some of them are being neglected. And so they're to choose some men, some deacons to take care of this problem. They say this, Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. So look for men who are full of the Holy Spirit. It comes through maturity in Christ. Then in Acts chapter 11, verse 24, when Paul and Barnabas are being set aside for the work of the church, Barnabas is described as a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. In Acts chapter 13, verse 52, the disciples then are described as, as, as men, disciples who were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as a person matures in their faith, the Holy Spirit has more and more of a hold on a person's life. So where were you when you first, um, how mature were you in your faith when you first came to trust in Christ? Are you more full of the Spirit today than you were then? How about the time that you first came through those doors at Village Bible Church? Are you more full of the Spirit now than you were that day? I hope so. And that's on me if you weren't. It's on you too, but I'll take the blame right now. There's a maturity that happens as the Holy Spirit has more and more of us that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit. So you say, well, I don't know if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm a Christian. I believe. How can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Let me give you a couple quick things. The first command from the New Testament that we have concerning the Holy Spirit and His indwelling with us from the Apostle Paul is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. It says, um, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't grieve Him. Grieving the Holy Spirit is doing things that the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do. So say you're uh, on your phone, and there's something on your phone that you want to look at. 
And the Holy Spirit is there speaking inside your heart, and He's saying, don't click on that. Don't click on that. If you click on that, you're grieving the Holy Spirit of God who lives inside you. It's sinning, doing the thing that the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to do. Then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, we read not to quench the Spirit of God. Quenching the Spirit of God is not doing the things that He asks you to do. So it's you at the supermarket one day, and there's a friendly, talkative person right next to you, and, and you, you're, you can start talking to them, and you hear the Lord say, hey, show, tell this person about Jesus. Hey, tell them about the church that you go to. Hey, share with them something. And you say, you know, I'm a little late, God. I, I don't have time to do that right now. That's quenching the Spirit. You're not doing the things that He asks you to do. So don't grieve the Spirit of God. Don't quench the Spirit of God. Rather, confess your sin to Him and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You want to have the Holy Spirit fill you afresh today? Start by confessing all known sin to Him. Do you have sin in your life that you're struggling with right now? Confess it to Him. Expose the sin. Get into the light. Confess all known sin. Is there somebody that you need to forgive and you've refused and your heart has grown cold and callous to them? Here, I'll, I'll test. You can test to see if God is true and who is he, does He work according to His Word. Ask the Lord, Lord, if there's anybody that I need to forgive, please just show them to me right now. I dare you to pray that prayer. God, if there's any sin in my life that I need to expose, expose it to me right now by your power and see what God will do. And then ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. This is the fellowship that we have. These are benefits of knowing God. They're amazing. Now, there are also benefits with other Christians. Almost done now. You're doing good. With Christians, we experience benefits as well. Uh, the, jot this down. You are on a team, or you are a part of a tribe. Okay? This is a benefit. Some of you remember what it was like to not be chosen to be on a team, and that stunk, didn't it? It hurts. Nobody wanted to pick you, but hey, guess what? You're picked here. And the God of heaven and earth picked you. You're on His team. That's a great thing. That's a great thing. You're part of a team. The second thing is this. This team is essential when facing trials and tribulations. It's so important to have this team when you go through trials and, and tribulations, hard times in life, that you would have a team around you to help you. You know, I've, I've experienced this time and time again, even going back to the people that didn't like to smile at that church. You know what? They had a heart that was big for people who were hurting. They had a heart for people around them that were experiencing great difficulties and trials and tribulations. And, and, and I know maybe you're one of them. You're here and you want to love on somebody and strengthen someone and be with someone as they go through this hard time. You're a team player. I know. I know many of you. The last one is this. This team helps with temptations. It's great to be a part of a team. It helps us in the trials and, and, and the tribulations, but it's also vitally important in dealing with temptations. It's called accountability. Now, don't be freaked out about accountability. That's always scary. But trust me, the best possible place to be is in a place with a team who understands each other and can help one another through the temptations that we all face. What temptations are you facing right now? Does anybody on the team know about it? Trust me, in the light is much better than in the darkness. The devil keeps his power in the darkness. Tell someone today on the team, and they'll help you with the temptations you're facing. Now well, let's close with this. There's a risk of forsaking this fellowship. There's a risk of forsaking fellowship. Here's the risk. The risk is you're not part of the team, or you're outside of the team, and you set yourself up for disaster. Disaster. Some years ago, there were um, researchers in Africa. They were studying zebra life. And they were watching zebras and recording zebras and trying to see how the herd mentality worked and how everything worked. And, and they began to realize that they had a hard time identifying the zebras 
that they were studying. So for example, this is a rudimentary example, but there's a zebra. I'm watching what they're doing. Okay, I'm watching what they're doing. I go down and write down some. I look up uh, which zebra am I looking at right now, okay? And so they couldn't distinguish between zebras when they were trying to study them. So then they thought, how can we take care of this problem? So they decided to put two different things, either a tag in their ear or to paint a red mark on the tops of their two ears. That way they could understand which one they're studying and, and keep their notes complete and right and correct. The problem is, they found that very quickly after they made those marks on the zebras, the zebras would be taken out by lions. They'd be taken out. And they said, what, what's going on here? We thought that the lions only picked on the, the sick ones, the sickly ones, the, the, little, the little ones, the ones that couldn't keep up. And it, they do pick on those ones, but it's not because they're sick. It's because they're different. It's because they're identifiable. And so these ones that they are putting the tag on their ears or, or marking them on the tops of their ears, they become distinguishable from the rest of the pack, and it was just a magnet for the lions to come and to devour the zebras. And it, in the same way, we become identifiable from the darkness and from the world when we stray from the fellowship that God has created us to be a part of. I can think of so many people. I had such a bad experience of church. People were rotten to me. They were rude to me. They hurt my family. I'm never going back to that place again, to your own peril, because you're outside the fellowship. And I know there's churches that stink, okay? And I know there's people that are mean, because we're all sinners. But I, I'm telling you this. Forsake the fellowship at your own peril. At your own peril. God has created this, and it is an essential thing. It's our community. It's our partnership with one another. It's never going to be perfect because we're all sinners. But by God's grace, we can be a team together and help one another through the storms of life and the trials and tribulations and the temptations, and we can be each other's back as we have fellowship with one another, as we have fellowship with God himself. It's a beautiful thing, the church. 